1 Corinthians chapter 10. Give you a moment to get in there and get settled. This is, God bless you ladies, amen. Uh, Israel's mistakes, our warning. And I've kind of taken a little, little side route, which I'm prone to do. I do it often. I've got it in my mind that I'm just going to teach the Bibles nice and slow and easy. and let's, under, let's get some deep things from the Word of God in us. Can I hear you say amen? So I landed here a few weeks ago, 1 Corinthians 10. This is showing us the things that happened to Israel, the things that they did, the mistakes that they made. And Paul said that they are written as examples to us and samples. He uses both words. And they're written for our admonition and for our learning so that we would not make the mistakes that they made. If you have an older brother or sister and you're the youngest, I was the youngest, my sister was older, and I got a little wisdom from watching her make some mistakes and mom and dad finding out about them and the punishment that she got. And I told myself, I'm not going to do what my sister did. I did all new stuff that my sister never thought of. Amen? Okay, but I didn't do what she did. And that's what God's trying to give us. That's why we've still got the Old Testament in our Bible. That's one of the reasons why we still have it in our Bible. It's for our learning. Don't do what Israel did. Watch out now. Those of you who think you stand lest you fall, okay? So watch out for these things. And so let me get to where, we were, where we're kind of going discussing tonight. We're going to talk about baptism. We're going to talk uh, for the next few weeks on some things related to that. 1 Corinthians 10, Moreover, brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that all our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea and were all baptized unto Moses in the cloud and in the sea. And did all eat that same spiritual meat, did all drink the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. But with many of them God was not well pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. And uh, now these things were our examples, to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Let me hear God's people say amen. And so I, we're going to talk for... Uh, I don't know how long it's going to take us. I've already, I had my notes all set tonight when I come over here to the church from the hospital. I got to looking at some things and I just, I've added probably 10, 15 more verses to it. Is that okay with everybody that we just kind of learned something from the Bible? Amen? So we're talking about baptism. And so baptism was given to us, and you see up there on the screen, Christ's example. So we're going to look there first. Turn your Bible to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. Matthew 28, if you want to kind of have those places ready in your Bible, because we're going to go to them. And here's what caught my attention tonight, is that Matthew 3 and Matthew 28 share some things in common. Not just the idea of baptism and what it's about, but there's another link between these two passages in your Bible, between Matthew 3 and Matthew chapter 28. So Matthew chapter 3 first, verse 13 this is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. How old is he when he does this? Anybody know? Twelve? Boy, I wish I had a buzzer. Okay. Uh, Thirty years old when he begins his earthly ministry. All right. So the Bible says, verse 13, Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him, But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. Now I'm going to slip in something here real quick for you. Okay, If, you've, if you read the book, The Da Vinci Code, or you saw the movie, that wasn't so much in the movie as it was in the book. Dan Brown was basing some of the ideas from The Da Vinci Code on what some other authors had written. And the idea amongst... Those in secret groups, secret societies, this and that and the other, was that Jesus was a disciple of John, meaning that John was the master and Jesus was the student. There's even a painting that Leonardo da Vinci painted. These nuns commissioned him 
to paint a painting of a baby John the Baptist and a baby Jesus with Jesus' mother, the Virgin Mary, and Elizabeth, John's mother, and an angel. I can't remember what the name of the angel was. So when John, or excuse me, when Da Vinci painted this portrait, the nuns took one look at it and said, burn it. That's not, we're not, we're not taking this. Because that, and it's still in existence today, that painting shows Jesus, baby Jesus kneeling with his hands together like this in front of and toward John the Baptist. And John, baby John the Baptist is giving Jesus the three-finger salute blessing. Da Vinci believed that Jesus was a student of John the Baptist and John was the, was the master of Jesus. What does your Bible tell you? John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me. John wasn't the master. Jesus was. That's why he said, I need to be baptized of you. I don't need to baptize you. Okay? John knew his place. Amen? Amen. He, he was older, but he didn't try to play, usurp authority over Christ. He knew who he was. He submitted to him. So John forbade him. Verse 15, And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it, or allow it now to be, uh, to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And what we're talking about is baptism. Is baptism necessary for salvation? Yes, if it's Holy Spirit baptism. No, if it's water baptism. There is a difference. When you study your Bible, you have to put that difference in there. Water baptism only reveals what should have already happened on the inside, and that is the Holy Ghost washes you clean, gives you an answer of a clean conscience before God, all right? And so anyway, baptism fulfills all righteousness. Holy Ghost baptism fulfills all righteousness. Then he suffered him. He allowed him. Verse 16, And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, and by the way, you don't have to go in the water if all John is going to do is sprinkle you like that. Yeah. Amen? The Ethiopian eunuch, they came out of the water. Okay? Meaning that Philip and the eunuch were in the water, probably waist deep in it. And they had to come up out of the water. They went, he didn't sprinkle him. He put him down. Amen. Brought him back up. So, and, and I'll show you that from the Bible as well. And so Jesus, went, now watch this. Verse 16. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. The dove has wings. When you read Psalm 91 about being under the shadow of, the, of God's wings, it's the Holy Spirit. Okay? The Holy Spirit came down like a dove with wings. That Bible's right, amen? The Bible said God has wings. We need to remember who God is. The Father is God, amen? The Son is God, amen? The Holy Spirit is God. Okay? So keep that in your mind. So anyway, the Holy Spirit descended like a dove lighting upon him, verse 17, a low voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Now, who was that voice from heaven? It was the Father. He said, This is my Son. Now, I want you to look at this. What you have right here in your Bible is the destruction of the false doctrine of the Jesus-only doctrine which says that there is no, we would use the word Trinity, that's not in your Bible, the word Godhead is, there is no Godhead, there is no triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. That is a heresy, here's what they say. They say that is a heresy injected by the evil popes back in three or 400 A.D., and we're not going to believe it. Look at this passage, because they teach that Jesus is the all-encompassing God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That there are not three different persons. There's only one God, and that is Jesus Christ. When they baptize, they do not baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
they baptize in Jesus only, it's because they don't believe in the Godhead. They don't believe it. Okay? Now, let me just kind of help you with something. False doctrines and false teachings will always spring up as a result of someone trying to explain in a logical fashion the Godhead. They'll almost always get it wrong because they're trying to explain something to make it make sense to you. Now here's what I believe. I believe that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. I believe that Jesus said, I and the Father are one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I believe that Jesus is God. I believe that God, His Father, is God. I believe the Holy Spirit is God. Do I understand that in its perfect form? No! But my Word says, my Bible says, this is how it is, and I trust that. I believe it. Okay? So whenever, and there's people out there, guys like Finnis Dake and the whole Oneness Pentecostal group and other liberal scholars out there, they will try, the Jehovah's Witness, Jehovah's, Brother George, the whole Jehovah's Witness one day, I was, Saturday, I was studying for a message, I was pastoring out at Richwoods, and on a Saturday, I had my Bible and had my notebook out, and I was making notes on a sermon, the Jehovah's Witness came by and knocked on my door. And so they come by, and I talked to them a little bit, and they tried to give me the literature, and I thought, you know what? I'm going to get it and throw it away. That way nobody else will get it. Don't waste your time. They've got millions of dollars. They'll print more, okay? But I took it. You know what I did? I started reading it. And they started quoting all these Bible scholars that said that Jesus never claimed to be God and the doctrine of the Trinity is false, and it was added later, like, you know, three or four hundred years after the, none of the apostles believed it. And what they were doing, I didn't catch on at first, they were quoting liberal scholars. Liberal scholars don't believe much about the Bible. And as I read that, I, I had to stop, and I had to put that thing down, and I got down before God, and I said, God, that's, that's a lie. Tell me it's a lie. Okay, it was working on my head. That's how dangerous that stuff is. And when God, when God helped me, and God said, was, he was quoting scriptures to me, for there are three that bear record in heaven. I went, okay, I believe that. When I got to looking back at that thing again, then I noted that they were pulling scholars from Harvard and Yale and Princeton, and, and I'm going, there's your problem right there. We're quoting guys that don't believe the Bible to begin with, okay? But it, it had me there for a few minutes. Scared me a little bit, okay? So I would recommend don't take their literature. I'll tell you how, I'll tell you how rotten I am. It's a true story, okay? Truth, this is a true story. When I was in Bible college, I had a summer internship uh, down in uh, Bryan, Texas, where Texas A&M is. And the pastor is named Bill Jones. He was a missionary to Africa, and him and his wife, and he was pastoring in the U.S. And there was a man that I've known since I was a boy named Wes Bigelow. He grew up down here in Farmington, was part of uh, the Farmington Free Will Baptist Church down here. And uh, I knew him, and so we were working together. I was working for them and just kind of learning pastoral ministry from them. And we were out on visitation one day, and there was a young couple that had come to the altar there at the church several months back, and they, like, like we see a lot of times, they came for a while, and then they just kind of, you didn't see them anymore. And so we went over there to visit, and Wes said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of work on them a little bit, and I'm going to kind of play a little bit mean with them, telling them, look, you need to get back in church. You need to get back in the house of God. So I let Wes do the talking, and we visited, and they had made some sort of mention about some other churches had been by and had given them some literature and some things like that. We got all done with the meeting, and Wes said, well, let's, before we leave, let's have a word of prayer. So we stood up, and when I stood up, I looked on, on top of their television set was some of that literature. And I didn't, it just something in me said, that ain't right. So when we prayed, I backed up to the TV like this. I'm not making this up. And while everybody's head was bowed and their eye was closed, I grabbed that literature, and I stuck it down in my <coughs> pocket there. So we bade him farewell and got in the car and we took off down the road and I went to digging that stuff 
stuff out of my back pocket. And sure enough, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society, it was Jehovah's Witness, and Wes said, where did you get that? I said, I stole it off their television set. <laughs> well, what is it? I said, it's Jehovah's Witness literature. Don't tell me I did something wrong now, because I, I don't think they should have this in their, in their living room. I, it's not, I'm not making that up. I did it, okay? So anyway... <laughs> Uh, I don't know where I was going with that. But anyway, false doctrine about the Godhead. And if you look at this right here, it'll help explain it to you. Number one, we see Jesus in body form. He just came up out of the water. He is the Word of God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See how simple that is? That's Jesus Christ. He comes up out of the water, and He is God. But then we see another bodily presence. It is the Holy Spirit who is descending down from heaven, just like a dove, and He lands. Now, listen to me now. If you've got a false doctrine about the Trinity, then you must, in your mind, say that He landed on His own shoulder. Okay, because they say that Jesus is the Spirit and He is the Father. And they don't believe in a God the Father, God the Son. They don't believe in that. The Spirit comes down in visible body form and lights on the shoulder of Jesus Christ. That is the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit of God. It is separate from Jesus. Amen? Then we hear a voice. We don't see the bodily presence of God because if we did, we'd die. Okay? But we hear the voice. Peter said, I heard that voice. Okay? He said, he heard the voice. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And what you have right here is the presence of all three that are in the Godhead. They are separate from one another and yet they are one. Do you believe that? Do you understand it? But I believe it. Okay? Don't start adding to or taking away from what this says. It says it. I can picture it in my mind, and I believe it, and I don't quite understand it, but I still believe that they are three, and yet they are one. Because John said there are three, and these three are one. Now, I don't know what kind of math that is. Amen? Three does not equal one. Well, it does in that case. And that's what I believe. Let's go to Matthew 28. Because, look here. Now, Jesus is being baptized. And at his baptism is all three of the Godhead. The Son, the Father, and the Spirit. So then in Matthew 28, when Jesus commissions us to go out and baptize people... How does he tell us to do it? He says, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. When I step inside that baptistry and I baptize people, you will hear me say, I baptize ye my brother or ye my sister in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And all of God's people said... Amen. You know why I do that? That's what my master told me to do. That's what my Lord and Savior told me to do. And I do not have permission to go around that, to sidestep it, to think something different. I don't have permission of that. I do it exactly the way my boss, my Lord, told me to do it. And so if I'm, if I'm in error, I'm going to err on the Lord's side every time. Amen. But that's the way he told us to do it. By the way, I, I talked to old Stanley Jones one time. Some of you remember him. Old Stanley Jones tell me that he used to, when he was growing up, he, there was some old-time preachers back in his community around Hartville, Missouri. That's where he grew up. And he said, some of them preachers, he said, some of them Pentecostal preachers, they'd really get into it. They'd baptize them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit. He said, or they would baptize them in the name of the Father. And the Son. Boop, boop, boop. And the Holy Spirit. And then bring them back up. Okay? I just, I'll get it all out of the way and then baptize them. Amen? But I want you to notice this. On, in the same book of your Bible, 
on two occasions we have a teaching of baptism and what it's all about and the Ho and the Holy Spirit and the Father and the Son are present or are mentioned there Jesus when he was baptized was the presence of the Father presence of the Holy Spirit of course Jesus being the Son of God they were all there when he commissions us to go and teach all nations and baptize them we're supposed to take them with us when we do it yeah. amen so the Godhead is important when it comes to bringing people into the body of the believers of Jesus Christ knowing and understanding that Godhead now we Christians and I would I hate to use the word evangelical churches but in fundamental churches Bible believing churches to us this is an essential doctrine I don't like people calling God a liar by saying, oh, I don't believe in the Trinity. I read a book. I, read, I saw a YouTube video that said that was invented. Don't follow that stuff. Quit watching. You need to unplug the Internet. In fact, there's days, Wayne, and today's one of those days, I would like to find the master plug to the Internet and cut it and just tell everybody, get your Bible out and read it, for crying out loud. Amen? Because there are many false teachers out there leading many, many, many people away. And it grieves me, it burdens me that in some cases, once they've been led astray, you can't talk to them. Their mind is chafed just like they were a beast and you can't reason with them. 1 John chapter 5, turn there. So what I was looking at these two verses in Matthew and it just kind of put it in my mind. Maybe we need to talk about the doctrine of the Godhead. Maybe we, need to, maybe we need to pull some verses together that will help settle this issue in some people's minds because of the internet, because of false brethren, uh, false teachers that crept in unawares. Paul said, after my departure, grievous wolves will come in, not sparing the flock. Jesus warned us about false teachers and false prophets. Many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Jesus talks about Lucifer, Satan, who shows himself to be an angel of light. And he is transformed into an angel of light. And he said, it's no mystery that his, his workers transform themselves into the apostles of Christ, meaning that they're going to try to teach you and tell you that they have the authority of God to tell you that. Joseph Smith comes to mind he told everybody and said that God has given me the authority to tell you what I'm telling you today and Paul said watch out because they got another Jesus they're gonna give to you another spirit another gospel that's what they're gonna do for you okay now first John chapter 5 to me this verse nails it you read this verse and you you have a double witness in Matthew 28 you have that uh, third witness in Matthew chapter 3 when Jesus was baptized and now you have it in plain English for you in no ambiguous terms whatsoever it says exactly what it means first John chapter 5 verse 6 this is he that came by water and blood even Jesus Christ isn't it interesting here again we're speaking of the Godhead the Father the Son and the Holy Ghost and here we have water being represented the water of baptism Isn't it cool okay water and blood even Jesus Christ not by water only but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit that beareth witness because the Spirit is truth. And even if you look in verse 6, you can see a differentiation between Jesus Christ and the Spirit of God. He is speaking of them, John is speaking of them, as if they are two individuals. And they are. And yet, they are one. Because you'll see in some places in the New Testament where it talks about the Holy Spirit or the Spirit of Truth or in some way referencing the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Ghost. Then you'll find other places where it's the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of His Son. Is there a difference between the Spirit of Jesus Christ and God's Holy Spirit? Nope. One and the same. When you... When we pray, when we do what we call, we lead people in that sinner's prayer. Ask Jesus into your heart, right? Well, who comes in there? The Spirit of His Son, Jesus Christ, living inside of the Holy Spirit of God. Baptism of the Holy Spirit is not something that happens a few weeks down the road at a revival meeting after you got saved. I want to tell you something. If you don't have the indwelling Holy Ghost in you, you are not saved. You're not saved, okay?
I may get into that. I don't know. But anyway, but so he said, now in verse 7, For there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Y'all are looking at me funny. I just was quoting from the NIV. What's wrong? It's exactly right. 1 John 5, 7 is missing out of the New International Version, the New American Standard Version, the Holman Standard Version, which is the Southern Baptist, Southern Baptist Convention, as far as I'm concerned, can just scrap their doctrinal statement on the Godhead because they took out the verse that nails it. Took it out of the Holman Standard Bible, Southern Baptist Bible. Uh, revised Standard Version, English Standard Version. Um, what was the, um, all that Bible came out in the 70s, the, it wasn't, the, it wasn't a translation, it was like a paraphrase, the Living Bible, the Living Bible took it out, the, so, so the scholars got together and they had the New Living Testament or the New Living Bible, which is a little bit better than a paraphrase of the Bible, but they still took it out. They have omitted verse 7 completely out of the Bible. And they put a note down there on the bottom that says, the oldest and best manuscripts do not have 1 John 5, 7. You know what they're telling you? You have our permission to not believe that verse 7 is the Word of God. We're the scholars and we're telling you you don't need it. That's what they're telling you. Now, the oldest and best manuscripts that they're referring to are the Vatican, and the Mount Sinai Monastery one. Those two do not have 1 John 5, 7. Okay? I will tell, I'll, I'll just lay it out truthfully. There's manuscripts from 1000 A.D. that has 1 John 5, 7 in it. Previous manuscripts that are in the majority text where the King James was based on that verse has been omitted in some earlier manuscripts that are part of the good manuscript line. Does that mean that somebody in 1000 A.D. injected that verse into that text? No, because there are early witnesses to 1 John 5, 7 being in what John wrote going as far back, I think, as the mid-200s A.D. One guy, uh, Cyprian, Man by the name, of, I, I got a good friend. I went to Bible college with him. Where he was a buddy of mine. He is a Greek and Hebrew scholar, and he hates the NIV. He loves King James. But he called me one time, and he said, Mike, I'm, I'm writing a commentary on 1 John. And he said, I've been commissioned to write this commentary on 1 John, and he said, I believe 1 John 5, 7 should be in the Bible. And he said, but the problem is, the, the earliest manuscript that we have is from 1000 A.D., he said, do you know of any other early witnesses to it? And I'm going, here's, here's the guy now that got a doctorate in theology, and I dropped out after my third year. And he's asking me, okay? But you know why he called me? He knew I believed that book. He knew I believed the King James Bible, okay? And I said, you know what, Craig? I said, I just, I just found this out. A man by the name of Cyprian quoted 1 John 5, 7, and he went, hang on. Yeah, I have Cyprian's writings right here, and I'm going, of course you would. He had a book with Cyprian's writings in it, and he found it. Cyprian wrote, as our beloved brother John testified that there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. He quoted it word for word. It was there. Somebody took it out, and God had it put back in. Okay? It's there. But look at what it does. If you take that out, it destroys the most clear, fundamental verse in the whole Bible that just nails the Godhead. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Do you believe that? Yes, amen. That's all you need to do is just believe it. Now, when we get to heaven, we'll understand it. But right now, we see through a glass darkly. But then, face to face. So this is where faith comes. You know that word faith? Trust? 
So God, even though I don't understand this, I trust your word and I believe it. Take that same principle now and apply it to something that you know God is leading you in or God is wanting you to do and you don't understand why God is doing it this way. And God just simply says, trust me. Even if I explained it to you, you wouldn't understand it. So just trust me. I've been good to you all your life, have I not? Yes. Then just trust me, because I'll be good to you this time too. I'll never let you down. I'll never, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's where we trust God, even when we don't understand. Okay? I had my grandkids over today. They're wanting to bounce all around Lisa's hospital room. Bounce on the bed, okay? When you tell a three-year-old boy, quit bouncing on the bed, and he says, why? What good is it going to do for you to try to explain to him why you shouldn't bounce on the bed? Really, the only, the only answer you should give is swat his backside and said, because I said! Okay, that's it. That's done. He won't understand why you, he can't jump on the bed. He won't understand that. His brain ain't big enough. Ours is not big enough to understand there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Lord, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. But I believe it and I trust it. Okay? That verse belongs in the Word of God. And then there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now, I don't have this note in front of me, but here's what you do. I, I latched onto this here about a year or so ago. Remember in the Old Testament where I think it was God or maybe Joshua or somebody said, I bring, I call to witness heaven and earth to witness against you. There, does that sound familiar to people? You can look that verse up. Heaven, I call to witness heaven and earth to witness against you. I think Moses said it. Okay, the witness in heaven is the three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. And then the witness in earth is the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Okay, that's heaven and earth witnessing together. Now, I'm going to show you something that I showed the very first people that I ever showed this to is the people out in Kenya when I was out there a couple weeks ago. Okay, I have not taught this here, but it came to me. I think it was on the plane when it when it just really hit me, okay? I'll, I'll, I'll take a few minutes. Um, Lisa's probably asleep, so just let her sleep for a while, okay? But I want to show you this. I think this is profound, and I think it's neat, okay? The Bible describes the relationship between Christ and the church as the head and the body, amen? We are the body. We are members of the body in particular, okay? Now, when the body needs water, where does the water come from? The head. God did not put a spout in our armpit. Thank God for that. Okay? When the body needs food, where does it come from? It's the head. When the body needs air, where does the air come from? The, either the nose or the mouth. It's all coming from the head. The head is above the body. That symbolism is there. When you study the head and things like that, you'll see it in the Bible. That idea is the head is above all things in the body. Christ is, the brains of the body is in the head. It's not in the body. Amen? And the nerve impulses are sent from the brain down the spinal, 33 bones, 66 connections in total coming out of your backbone where the brain is talking to the body in 66 nerve bundles coming out of your 33 bone spine. But see, they jumped and shouted in Kenya, all right? I don't know. Wait a minute. I didn't, I didn't teach them that. That's somewhere else. But anyway, here's what I'm saying to you, okay? We have the head, which is above us, and we know that head is Christ, and Christ is above us, and he is in heaven, okay? But when the head brings in the air, and he's going to give it to the body, where does it go from the head to where? The lungs. The lungs are the seven spirits of God. And ask yourself the question, where are the lungs? They're not in the head. Where are they? They're in the body. The lungs represent the Holy Spirit of God. Spirit means breath, pneuma, pneumatic tools. It means air, breath. 
And there's two of them, Old and New Testament. And when Jesus left, he sent the Comforter down, and the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, is with the body all the time. Isn't that neat? He said, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, these three are one. There are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. The Spirit is down here on the earth in the midst of the body. That's good, isn't it? Amen. Now, let me, let me just do this. I'll kind of show you. We'll, we'll pick this up next Wednesday night, all right? Uh, what I did was I just pulled verses from your Bible where all three members of the Godhead are mentioned in particular. In other words, you see them segmented and separate, and yet they are one. John 15, 26, But when the Comforter is come, whom I will send unto you from the Father. You have the Father mentioned, you have the Spirit mentioned, and you have Jesus mentioned in that same verse. Three separate, and yet they are one. Even the Spirit of truth, which proceedeth from the Father, he shall testify of me. Ephesians 1, 17, That the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give unto you the Spirit of wisdom. So here in this one verse, you've got Jesus Christ being mentioned as separate from God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit being separate from from Jesus and the Father, and yet they are all three one. When Jesus said, when the Comforter comes, he's not going to speak of himself. He's going to speak of me. And the Father is going to give me all things. All things are going to be delivered to me of the Father, and then the Spirit will take that and give it to you. You see, they are separate. And yet they all are working one in the same. The Spirit does not deviate from the Word. So, if we have a Spirit, if Sasha got up dancing, shouting, shouting hallelujah, speaking in tongue, and saying, God's given me a word of knowledge, and He told me to get behind the pulpit, Pastor Mike, and deliver the Word to you. Should we let her up there, Sister Pam? Absolutely not. Why not? That deviates from the word of God. The woman let the women be silent in the church. She's not even supposed to speak in tongues in the house of God. You go read 1 Corinthians 14. She, the spirit does not deviate from the word of God. They speak the same. Amen? There are three that bear record in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. You believe that? Say amen. I've got a bunch more of this stuff, but I'm going to let you go. I'm going to go back and see how Sweetie Pie's doing, all right? So let's stand to our feet.